We think that humans are the only species that can engage in magic, and that simply isn't true. Evolution has provided spectacular magical abilities to many animals, especially in vision, and I want to talk to you about five of those. My name's Ivan Schwab, and I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm interested in comparative optics and visual physiology and the evolution of how it got that way. So I want to talk to you about five superheroes of vision. I'm going to tell you about an animal that can see at a thousand times the force of gravity, an animal that can see through solid rock, an animal that can see without sunlight, and an animal that targets very much like a drone, and one that has five times the acuity you do. Let's talk about the first one. Eyes can withstand a thousand times the force of gravity, and the answer is woodpeckers. Larger woodpeckers strike up to 12,000 times a day at a thousand times the force of gravity with deceleration forces. They strike a tree up to 12,000 times at 15 miles an hour, and that's like you running into a wall at 15 miles an hour, 12,000 times a day, face first. They do this because they have a lower mandible that is very compact and very sturdy. I'll show you that in a minute. And they have an extra bone that wraps around their head that allows them to, to put force on the skull cap. The eyes also are used in protection to the very powerful dictatans, or third eyelid. You'll hear that word again. I've been working with a micro CT scanner to put a lot of flux into this dead, automobile dead woodpecker. And what we've done is we've calculated the house field units of the density of the lower mandible, and it's about five times the density of the upper mandible. Furthermore, the lower mandible extends beyond the upper mandible, so the upper mandible rarely engages much in the strike. So the power all goes through the base of the skull and down the muscles of the neck. And here's that geniohyoid bone you saw circling the... the um, Excuse me, was that a bone over the left eye? or? or yeah, that's a bone that rolls around the skull and inserts into the tongue. Um, no, the one over the eye. No, the, the, over the eye. These are sclerolossicals. These are bony plates within the eye. Um, most birds, many reptiles, uh, in fact all birds and most reptiles have the, these bones. I'm going to show you some more of those. Those bones are meant to uh, originally to help with accommodation. So I'll talk more about the sclerolossicals. So the, that, gives you the, that gives you the empty orbit as well as the ossicles on the other side. It, this is, is all done by removing the, 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 by removing the um, soft tissue digitally. All right, this is a geniohyoid bone, that bone you saw wrapping around the skull. And note the muscular fibers around it. And these are all radial, pulling on the bone to allow the, the bone to push down on the skull. Let's move on to number four. What's an animal that can see through rock? And those are trilobites. The reason it sees through rock is that the lenses are made of calcite. And calcite is a crystal limestone. In one direction, it's birefringent, as you can see from the, the dime beneath that crystal. Uh, this is, that's not the direction trilobites used. But this is among the first known eyes because the lenses uh, uh, fossilized. They didn't, they didn't uh, break down. The trilobites triumphed by having, by having a lens uh, doublet system called a Huygen-Descartes correction lens correcting for spherical aberration in one group. Now that group, as you can see here, is the Fakops group. And this is a trilobite from a sagittal side. And you can see the eye at the front. Here's a closer view of the individual units, the omatidia. Greek for little eyes, it has the individual units very much like the wasps that bother you at, uh, at a picnic. Here's a closer view, a diagrammatic view of those uh, individual eyes, those omatidia. And what we found is that the, these lenses have a doublet system, as you can see below. Those two portions of the lens have different refractive indices. And also, I'm going to show you a bit of a girdle to move that second lens. What I've done with this eye is applied high flux uh, micro CT scan uh, with uh, the ability to penetrate uh, rock, quite amazing. And what we've been able to do is isolate the cornea and the lens doublet system in individual form, and then a girdle that, that surrounds it. And then I've false colored it. The orange is the girdle, and the 
purple is the lower bowl of a lens, and the upper lens is uh, beneath that cap, which is the cornea. Now, this permits spherical aberration to be eliminated. We suppose that the animal is probably colorblind, probably monochromatic. Superhero number three, seeing without sunlight. That's ophthalmosaurus, probably uh, among the largest of eyes with a diameter of 240 millimeters. That's larger than a soccer ball and was able to track squid in total darkness, squid being bioluminescent. This animal also had the largest eye to body size of any vertebrate with an F number of 0.8. For those of you that don't know F numbers, yours at its best is about 2.0. Here's an example of this animal about the size of a double-decker bus with those scleral ossicles again. Those scleral ossicles allow us to calculate the diameter of the eye uh, also probably calculate what we think to be the size of the lens, which I'll show you in a moment. This animal fed mostly on the continental shelf, fed mostly on the continental shelf, but was capable of diving to uh, depths up to 1,000 to 1,500 meters the, beyond the quit point and still uh, hunt. It also had an interesting method of an interesting method of um, swimming. You'll note the eel on the left has two bends in its tail. The trout on the right has one bend. The ophthalmosaurus has one and a half bends. It, it swims better than the trout, but not as good as an eel because of it. Now this is a, a diagrammatic uh, look at the eye. You can see the lens behind the eye. The lens is a little over four inches in diameter, and the little plug you see behind that is a nutritive organ a projection, very much like the pectin in bird. It's called the conus in reptiles. As I said, this animal was larger than a double-decker bus, uh, very smooth in swimming. Swimming is a, another topic altogether. Now here goes how this guy would hunt. His pupil would dilate to four inches. He would uh, track down to up to 1,500 meters, catch the bioluminescent squid, and be off with them. Now, superhero number two, the most successful predator, and it will surprise you. These are dragonflies. Dragonflies didn't start out the way you see them in your garden. They started out in an animal that probably looked like a griffin fly. This animal arose about 320 million years ago, although the griffin flies are not direct ancestors, but rather they are a close ancient cousin. Griffin flies were the largest insect ever with a, about a 70 plus centimeter wing spread. That's the size of a raven. So imagine an insect coming at you with golf ball sized eyes the size of a raven. These are the largest insects ever known. The compound eyes were also the largest compound eyes ever known. This arose in the Carboniferous when oxygen levels were about 31% instead of the 21% of today. Now, eyes and insects breathe by a series of folded tracheoles. It's not a direct <coughs> oxygenation like ours is. So you get a larger eye because you get more diffusion of uh, oxygen. So I'm going to show you a video to illustrate the size of a griffin fly compared to a modern dragonfly. What you see first is a modern dragonfly on a stick. He will rise up, and you'll see the comparison to a griffin fly. This is the, my gift to you. You'll see this portion of the talk on a jump drive that I have given you. Now, dragonflies of today are probably as big as they're going to get. The eyes are probably as large as they're going to get because of lower oxygen level. But still, it's a spectacular eye with over 30,000 individual units in the larger dragonflies. Those are called omatidia, the individual units. Each eye has four visual pigments. You have three so they'll see into the ultraviolet with a flicker fusion rate approximately 10 times ours. And I'm going to go through that concept in just a moment. 80% of their first brain is devoted to vision, and 100% of their second brain is devoted to flight. Targeting is centered on a crosshair system, very much like a drone, and they're the most successful predator on Earth with a 95% success rate. Targeting relies on a vertical and horizontal uh, meridian, and they'll use the, the horizontal band of concentrated omatidia. Think of it as a greater concentration of pixels. Stereopsis occurs because of two different inputs, so the animal can gauge depth. 
and the vertical midline is recognized because it's two separate eyes. Now here's an image from above. Uh, you can see the two halves of the eye. Uh, one half uh, is a, a bit redder, and then down below it you see uh, some false pupils uh, checkering the, the second eye. And here's a different look with a crosshair of uh, concentrated omatidia, and those concentrated omatidia is what gives the horizontal beam and the uh, area below and above provide for the, the vertical aspect. Now flicker fusion is a visual physiology concept. It's the speed with which the brain separates images. You don't see movement really. You see separate images and then the brain assembles them. Same thing goes on in the dragonfly, only much faster. It processes those images much more quickly. By assembling them faster, he slows down motion. I'm going to show you a video of just what that means in real life. You'll see a, a bee or some other insect flying erratically, and a dragonfly will move into place, and you'll see through the eyes of a dragonfly as it more or less hunts for this animal. It'll find the animal, and once it gets it into the crosshairs, it is toast. <laughs> Now that means that dragonflies have a flicker fusion that will slow the flight of the target. This animal can slow life down. And this is physiologic magic we simply can't perform. Dragonflies are a result of the most successful predator with a 95% success rate, far better than lions or eagles or any other predator. This is sleight of the eye, if you will. Flight is another magic characteristic, but that, I don't have time for that one today. So superhero number one, the best vision on the planet, and how is that done? Falcons, of course. These have the best acuity and the best processing and the fastest processing. So what are the advantages, the magic advantages they have? Well, first of all, they have a cleaner and clearer cornea than you do. They have a flicker fusion rate that's about three times yours. And they have five times the concentration of photoreceptors to make that grain of the computer, if you will, five times better than yours. Here's a picture of a peregrine falcon's head, and one of the most important aspects for its cornea is the windshield wiper effect of the third eyelid. Note on the third eyelid there's a ridge, and that ridge is right at the outer edge. So let's look at that nictitan, that third eyelid histologically. And you can see out towards the right-hand side the little flange, and that's the ridge. This is on the inner surface of the lid, and is like a squeegee you'd use to clean snow or dust or anything off your windshield. It uses that flange to scrape the inside of the lid. But the real magic comes at the bottom of the image, and that is the feather epithelium, epithelial cells that have little fine hairs. And those hairs are very much like a comb, like you'd comb the rats out of your hair. And here it is on electron microscopic view. Note those little fimbri will fit into the micro rugae of the cornea, managed to clear it of dust so that it maintains its clarity even at a stoop of over 200 kilometers an hour. The second trick they use is they have two areas of sharp vision called fovea. And those two fovea have a high concentration of photoreceptors. The best one has five times what you have. So let's look to just to the right of that, and you can see that fovea in profile of what is known as an optical coherence tomogram. You can see the depth of it. That actually creates a little magnification called a convex clivate fovea because the index of refraction is different from the black area, the vitreous, and the image actually expands onto the retina a bit. But the real magic comes in the processing. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with histologic slides, this shows the difference between a human fovea, that best part of vision you're using to look at the slides, and for a hawk, I didn't have a falcon fovea, but what I did have is a hawk fovea or near the fovea. And note the middle layer. That middle layer in the hawk, as compared to the human, is three times at least the concentration of the human. That middle layer is the processing layer. That's where all the amacron horizontal cells, bipolar cells, these are cells that translate and talk to one another to make the image better. Basically, it's photoshopping its own image before it gets to the brain. So you do your processing in your brain much more slowly than a falcon does. So we can tell the conclusions here for this. We can tell that many animals are superheroes. They have superpowers, and each animal has an eye 
to fit its niche. And that niche is whatever it needs to do to eat and survive. Unusual niches require superheroes, and that's magic we can't perform. I want to thank people who've helped me with this presentation.